Hey y'all, welcome back to Friday Birth Prep. I'm Dr. Marta Perez, an OBGYN doctor and pregnant with my first baby, and I love to educate everyone on reproductive health care, especially around birth. So today we're going to talk about epidurals and their use for pain control during labor and delivery. <music> first part, we'll talk about pain in labor and pain control options in labor. Then we'll talk about exactly what an epidural is, the risks and benefits of an epidural, and if epidurals impact your labor or your C-section rate. Finally, I'll leave you with some final thoughts about my experiences when I counsel patients about using epidurals for pain control in labor. If you don't know exactly what labor is or if you're in labor, head back to episode one. I discuss how to tell if you're in labor or not and what happens during the labor process. Labor pain consists of two different types of pain. One type of pain is the intense feeling of contractions, which is commonly felt in the whole abdominal area, although also the low back, hips, and thighs. As the baby descends lower in the pelvis, you get the more acute or constant pain in the perineum, the vagina, the rectum, etc. So there's kind of two types of pain. The first part of labor tends to be mostly the contractions. The second part of labor is both the contractions and the actual baby moving through the pelvic structures and the pressure that that causes. It's important to note that pain is subjective, meaning pain is different for everyone. Just like people look different on the outside, different people are wired in their pain receptors differently. So labor may actually be more painful for one person and less painful for another person. Similarly, there are other things that contribute to pain and labor besides just how you're wired. Your expectations surrounding pain and labor, the amount of coping or tolerating mechanisms you have for pain, the size of your baby, the speed of the labor. I've had women who say different labors have totally different pain profiles and they're the same person. So it really depends. As proof of how biologically some women are very different than others and how they experience pain, there is a genetic variant that has been found in about 1% of people where it takes more pain input for their brain and their body to actually feel pain. Meaning these people, given the same experience, will feel less pain than everyone else. So just think about that, that pain isn't the same for everyone. It doesn't just mean you're bad or good at coping at pain. Pain, the experience is truly different between people. The most important thing I tell women leading up to birth as their doctor is to have a plan for your pain, no matter what that plan is. And we're gonna get to more of that at the end of the episode. What is an epidural? An epidural is a type of neuroaxial regional anesthesia, meaning that it relieves pain in a certain portion or region of the body through medication delivered in an area near our spinal canals. Epidural anesthesia for pain control in labor and delivery is safe, it is effective, and it is very popular. Anesthesiologists are the types of doctors who administer this type of pain control. An epidural works by delivering pain medication to the epidural space, which is a space next door and separated by a membrane to the area where our spinal cord is. So it's not in the same area of the spinal cord, it's adjacent to it. The medication is a mix of numbing medication, similar to what you would get when you go to the dentist, and some narcotic medication, but they're in very low amounts and they stay in that epidural region. The medication can go into that space through a catheter in either a continuous low level for many, many hours and can be refilled, or in a way that's on demand, like boluses, like if you click a button, or both. It can be at a low level that provides continuous infusion, and then you can ask for a little bit more with a button. Since it can be administered continuously like that, epidurals don't run out. So it's a myth that you should wait till later in labor to have an epidural because it will run out. Another type of neuroaxial regional anesthesia you might hear about is called a spinal. A spinal is similar to an epidural in that it is regional, meaning the certain region of the body administered near the, near the spinal canal, but a spinal is actually in the subarachnoid space, so it's next door, and it is one quick shot without a catheter being in. Now a spinal, because it's one quick shot, lasts for a certain amount of time, it's usually several hours, and then wears off. Spinals are really common when someone is having a C-section. So important to keep in mind that there's an epidural, a spinal, 
There's also something called a continuous spinal epidural, which is a mix between the two. If you have any questions about that, feel free to ask your OB doctor or the OB anesthesiology doctor. A common question I get asked is when can I get an epidural? And the answer is that you can get an epidural at any time in labor when you're admitted to the labor and delivery floor and you request one. I have heard some women say that they were told they should wait till later a certain number of centimeters till their contractions are a certain time apart. Usually I've only seen those kinds of things as criteria for admission to labor and delivery. And I've mostly seen women be able to obtain an epidural whenever they feel that their pain requires one and whenever they request it. Another question I get is what are the risks and benefits of using an epidural while in labor? And I'm going to break down the risks into a few different categories. The first category is maternal health risks. The second category is the risks to the labor process. And the third category would be the risks to the fetus. So let's go back and break those down. One, risk to the maternal health. Epidurals are extremely safe, extremely safe. In fact, the rate of any serious complications is so low that I can't memorize the numbers. I'm literally going to read them off to you. Hold on. The risk of an abscess or a hematoma in the area of the spine where the catheter sits is less than 0.001%. The risk of any nerve injury or permanent neurological damage from an epidural is 0.001%. 0.0003%. That's four zeros between the decimal point and the number three. Extraordinarily rare. So rare. These are really, really, really safe ways to control pain. One of the most common risks is something called a puncture headache or a post-spinal headache. And that's a headache that comes on in the days after an epidural that is positional, meaning it's worse when you're sitting up, better when you're laying down. That headache can be pretty severe, but it's usually self-limited, and there are some treatments for it. The rate of having that headache happen to you is about 0.7%, so less than 1%. There are some minor side effects that go along with having an epidural. It's common to have some itching from some of the medication that's used in the epidural. That's annoying, but it's not really risky. Another common complaint is a little bit of bruising or soreness in the area where the catheter sat. That usually goes away within days after birth. One of the other minor risks with an epidural is that when it goes in and the numbing medication numbs our nerves to experience pain, it also numbs some muscles. And so it's hard to move with an epidural. You won't be walking around, you'll be um, in the bed, although some women can move well, better than others. But it also affects the movement and the tone of some of the blood vessels. So sometimes your blood vessels dilate and you get low blood pressure. Typically that low blood pressure is very easy to treat with extra IV fluids or maybe some medications that help the blood vessels tighten back up. It may be associated with fetal heart rate tracing abnormalities that are very short lived, but overall it's not associated with any fetal harm or damage or increase in C-section rate. As far as fetal risks are concerned, I mentioned the low blood pressure. Again, this is usually something that is not commonly an issue for more than just a few minutes. It's temporary and resolves and doesn't cause any long-term problems, including not raising the rate for C-section. The other thing to think about is, is this medicine getting in my bloodstream and crossing the placenta to the baby? And the very low dose of these medications combined with the fact that they're mostly isolated to that one little area, the epidural space, means that the amount of these medications in the maternal circulation is very low. And so we don't see negative fetal effects from that at all. Interestingly, we have to compare too that when moms don't have any pain control at all, there can be some physical risks to the fetus of that too. Hyperventilating and increased stress hormones can cross the placenta and can have an effect. Not to say they're more dangerous, but just that the opposite situation of no pain control doesn't mean that there's no exposure to some stressful events for the baby as well. One other risk, although it's not really a risk, it's just something that happens, is that some epidurals might work better than others. Sometimes you get numbness in a one side that's stronger than the other, so you may feel a little more discomfort on one side versus the other. Or there might be what we call like a hot spot, like there might be one particular point where you're not feeling good pain control and you feel intense pain in that spot. If epidurals really aren't working well, a lot of times the anesthesia doctors will replace it and try again, or they can kind of put more medication in into the level, etc. So there are troubleshooting ways, but unfortunately we're all built a little differently and our bodies respond to medication a little bit differently. 
So not every person will have the exact same experience with an epidural. But if it's truly not working, usually we can replace it for something better. The biggest question I see is, does an epidural affect the progress of my labor or my chances of having a C-section? With extensive high quality studies, we've seen that epidural anesthesia does not increase or change C-section rates. So when you're making decisions about your pain control, I want you to know your C-section rate will remain the same no matter what you choose. And I hope you find that comforting. The second issue is about labor progress. If you forgot what the different stages of labor are, you can go back to episode one where I discuss the different stages of labor. But in asking if epidurals slow down the labor process, some studies have shown a small decrease in the first stage of labor, which is the time until complete dilation but that was only about 30 minutes. So it wasn't really that long of an amount of time. There was some question that maybe women in an epidural group needed oxytocin, but that result in a big Cochrane review, which is a very high quality review of many studies, touched the line of something that could have just been chance, not actual statistical truth. So it's hard to say. I think that's also probably a chicken and an egg scenario. Like, if your labor is going longer anyway, you're in more pain, maybe more likely to get an epidural and more likely to get oxytocin. So that is not statistically strong. And then there's the second stage of labor, which is the pushing process. A meta-analysis, which is a large grouping of randomized control trials, it did a little bit slow down the pushing process. So in women who had an epidural, a push for 7.66 minutes longer, less than 10 minute difference. So really not a huge difference there either. But I really want to assure all that my listeners and watchers and my community out there that the good high quality data shows no increase in C-section rate, small decrease in the first stage of labor, a 10 minute increase in the amount of time you push, and no difference to fetal outcomes with NICU admission, APGAR scores, or fetal acid base status changes. So really safe for babies too. A few studies have shown some increase in operative vaginal deliveries, meaning having to use either forceps or a vacuum at the time the baby is born vaginally. But some of that data was a little bit older from when the epidurals used to make women more numb and make it maybe a little harder to push. And newer studies haven't really shown that as much. I think that's maybe a, mur a murky area that I'm not quite sure if that's true or not. Okay, here's my final thoughts as an OB doctor about choosing a pain control method for your labor and delivery process. The most important thing I tell patients is this is your experience. I want you to have the very best experience you can have for you. That may be different for different women. The fact is that the pain of the labor process will be present, and there are lots of ways to manage it. We talked about epidurals today, and I briefly mentioned spinals, but there are other methods of pain control too, and I'm actually gonna get into those on an episode next week, so stay tuned for that. You may wanna hear about some of the different options. If your choice, or what you think your choice might be, is to go about the labor and delivery process without using medicine for pain control, then my next piece of advice is pick another method of pain control if it's not medicine. So some people use meditative breathing. They take classes on strategies for coping with pain as their mechanism. Basically, I just want you to feel empowered. I want you to have the experience you have. As your doctor who's been a part of many births, with medicine, without medicine, lots of pain, no pain, the few things I just wanna to touch on are that any choice that you make is great for you. Be flexible about your choices. Have an idea of maybe this is my plan for right now, but hey, maybe things don't go as expected and I choose another path, and be okay with that. You may not know exactly what it's gonna feel like, even if you've had children before, when labor comes around this time. A lot of women, honestly, choose both. They say, for a little while, I wanna be able to move around, I wanna kind of breathe through my contractions, use some of my non-medicine coping mechanisms, but then at some point, I'm gonna ask for an epidural so that I'm comfortable and, and able to experience a lesser pain experience. All right, thank you so much for joining me today where we talked about epidurals for pain control. As I mentioned, next week I'm gonna cover other pain control methods besides epidurals for labor and delivery pain. I would love to hear your questions, put them in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe and don't forget to hit that bell because you wanna be alerted about all my episodes so that you can have the most empowered and educated birth experience there is.
Again, thank you for joining me here. We have new videos every Friday. I'm over on Instagram talking about everything related to reproductive health, including birth control, periods, trying to conceive, fertility, and more. And it was a delight to have you. Again, questions in the comments, I will answer them. I hope that you have the best experience for you, and I hope you have a wonderful weekend.